much for attending today's program. My name is Erin Payton, and I'm the Executive Director of the 19th Century Charitable Association, which is located in Oak Park, Illinois. Our mission is strengthening our community through learning, giving, and the sharing of our landmark building. This is the final program for 2020, and we hope you've enjoyed all the programs we've put on for you this year via Zoom. We do have plans to start 2021 via Zoom as well, and we'll keep you updated as we all plod through this pandemic together to see if we will be able to put on any of our wonderful programs in our ballroom, which I know we all hope we can. Today's program is gonna be another great one, which will probably spark some ideas and questions for you. And if you have them, please put them in our chat or Q and A. And if we have time at the end of the program, I will single you out and unmute you and you can ask your question to our presenter yourself. Without further ado, I'm going to bring to the program, Deb Hammond, who is our literature chair on our committee. Hi, Erin. I am really pleased to uh, be here on the last program of 2020 and uh, give a, a program that I think is going to be fascinating. When I first heard about this book, I said, oh my gosh, this is such an interesting story. I have to get it because Binga was the first Chicago banker. He opened the first bank uh, for black Americans uh, in Chicago and he just had an amazing career. He ended up being charged with embezzlement and he was defended by none other than Clarence Darrow. So it's a really exciting story, which Don's going to tell us about. Don Hainer's a lifelong Chicago who lives down in Beverly. He started out as an attorney, but switched to journalism. He worked his way up as a reporter, ending as the editor in chief of the Chicago Sun-Times in 2012. And what a tenure he had. The paper won many awards for investigative reporting, a Pulitzer Prize for local reporting in 2011. He has co-authored three books, including another one that I think would be interesting to read, Streetwise Chicago, a history of Chicago street names. Uh, he completed a fellowship at uh, the University of Maryland's Knight Center for specialized journalism on race, class, and ethnicity. Uh, he worked with Mary Mitchell, who everybody knows, on an award-winning series, The Great Divide, Racial Attitudes in Chicago. And he helped design the largest poll on race relations ever conducted in Chicago. So I'm really pleased to present Don Hainer to talk about Binga, the rise and fall of Chicago's first black banker. Don? Hi, everybody and uh, welcome and let me thank the uh, 19th Century Charitable Association for having me and thank you all for joining today. You know, 100 years ago, we were coming out of a pandemic and also uh, in the, the aftermath of racial turmoil and animosity following the 1919 race riots. Binga's time, and I point that out, is because Binga's time was not unlike our own. I'd like to explain Binga's importance to Chicago and the nation at this time and, and highlight the importance of Chicago's African-American neighborhood called the Black Belt. I'd also like to describe a bit about how I found the details of Binga's life. You know, I was working on Binga, every time I would mention it to somebody, they'd say, I've never heard of him. Who is he? And for me, that was kind of the point. Uh, why had his story never been told in full? I've just got it. Now, when Binga's story involves a bank, it's broader and more complicated than that. After all, Binga stood out in the 1920s. He was a self-made millionaire, a realtor, an entrepreneur, and of course, Chicago's first bank banker. In the early 20th century, he was also celebrated as a rags to riches story. He preached the popular all-American gospel of self-help and hard work. He lectured with Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. E. B. W. E. B. Du Bois. He was interviewed by Carl Sandburg fictionalized by James T. Farrell and praised by Mother Catherine Drexel, who would become America's second Roman Catholic saint. So what happened to his story? I think there are a couple explanations. Now, just this is a picture of Jesse Binga at the height of his power and his success in 1927. And this was used in an uh, article in Crisis, the Crisis Magazine, which was the NAACP magazine founded by uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. And this uh, picture accompanied a biography about him 
written by his assistant at the bank. Now, I'll get back to the, the explanations on what happened to his story. First, there wasn't a lot of official acts to preserve Chicago's black history in, in Binion's time. In the first three decades of the 20th century Chicago, the city's black population grew from 30,000 to close to a quarter million. Yet it wasn't until 1932 that the city had a library built for and in the so-called Black Belt. That library, however, also became a beginning point to preserve black history. And some early advocates were Binga's contemporaries, including Vivian G. Harsh. Harsh was Chicago's first black librarian and became the head librarian of that first Black Belt library. And interestingly, when Vivian Harsh was just a young library clerk in 1912, she was a guest at Binga's wedding. But Binga's lost story may have, more than, may have been more than just a question of black history being marginalized. It was also a question of who he was, what he said and what he represented. Binga was a guy who would push back. He was a tough guy. As W.E.B. Du Bois said, Binga wasn't a guy who would kowtow or bend his neck when he spoke to white men or about them. And Binga himself was a bit elusive, which also complicates the telling of his story. Even though every man, woman, and child in Chicago's Black Belt came to know his name, Binga was a puzzle, an enigma. As the legendary Chicago historian Timuel D. Black once told me, people knew his name, but for the most part, he was a mystery. Gossip and rumors swirled around his marriage to Eudora Johnson, the sister of the city's most powerful policy king. And, and Binga's public demeanor was largely aloof and unapproachable, even as he greeted guests at his bank. I'm going to show you, whoop, I'm going to show you a picture of Binga's wife. This is the best picture that I think is out there, and this appeared in the Defender on her death. Eudora, Binga, Eudora was Binga's second wife. She was 41 years old when they were married in 1912. And Jesse was her first and only husband. Eudora was said to be smart, sweet, and a savvy real estate investor. She was also rich. Now, some of that wealth came from this guy, John Mushmouth Johnson. Eudora's older brother Mushmouth came to Chicago with his parents in 1854 when he was three years old. When Mushmouth came to the city, Chicago had just gotten its first gas streetlights and telegraph wires. His mother was said to have once worked for Mary Todd Lincoln as a washerwoman when the president's widow lived in Hyde Park. Uh, as a teen, Mushmouth worked as a porter in a white gambling house. He was smart, disciplined, and tough, and he quickly rose to run the whole show, including a lucrative game of policy, which uh, later transmogrified in what we now know as the Illinois State Lottery. Back then, the most popular bet was on three numbers called a gig. A blindfolded policy writer pulled two sets of 12 capsules from a spinning wheel containing 78 numbered capsules. Each set of 12 was called the leg. To win, you needed all three of your numbers to be in one leg. Now, Bingo was publicly well-known and outspoken, but he lived a private life. He and his wife rarely entertained more than family at their spacious house at 59th and South Park Avenue, now known as Dr. Martin Luther King Drive. And apart from visits to the opera, the Art Institute, and perfunctory public appearances, the Bing is mostly kept to themselves. He worked hard, made money, a lot of money, and he accomplished the American dream. And, and he accomplished the American dream, and then he seemed to be published for it. In fact, he became a target. When Binga represented success, while Binga represented success in and beyond the Black Belt, his triumphs also made him one of the most hated men in Chicago, at least in white Chicago. If I could go to the next slide, Aaron. This is a map of, of uh, the Black Belt. It's a little cut off too, but I think you can kind of see where it all began. This was, the Black Belt actually ran from 22nd Street to 39th Street. And uh, it was a small crowded area because it was discrimination that kept it that way. This was a little bigger than it, when it first started. And you can see the stockyards were over to the west and Bridgeport was over here and Canaryville, which is a, uh, old Irish neighborhood. But uh, the hate of Binga began when he dared to break the color line that walled off the Black Belt, which was this small crowded area created through discriminatory practices that used both laws and violence to uh, keep Black Chicagoans in there. At the beginning, it was a thin sliver of land 
that roughly extended down State Street from 22nd to 39th Street, with some parts as narrow as a half mile, as you can see right, right here. And a large part of the Black Belt was uh, between the Rock Island line on the east or on the west and the uh, Illinois Central on the uh, east. But Bing expanded these confined boundaries, and all this outraged whites in and around the Black Belt. The narrative of Binga's life is as telling as it was prophetic. It mirrors the stories of Chicago's South Side. It is essentially the stories of the origins of segregation in Chicago, the very beginning. Binga was there at the beginning. When he arrived in Chicago in 1892, blacks were not yet segregated. Blacks and whites sometimes lived on the same street, the same block, the same building, and the same floor. In fact, in the late 1800s, Italians were more segregated than blacks. But that was soon to change and that was a lot because of Bingo. Bingo was a Pullman porter for years before he settled in Chicago in 1892. <clears throat> and he was also a, uh, a barber. But he came and he came with a different plan when he came to Chicago. And if you go to the next slide. He looked around the city for a place to put a peddler cart and he chose 12th and Michigan, which is, here's Here's the Illinois Central Railroad, which was at 12th and Michigan then, or Roosevelt and Michigan at the south end of Grand Park. And this was when it was brand new. <clears throat> and uh, this was heralded as the largest train shed in the world and built for the coming crowds of the 1893 World's Fair. Being a new travel and the railroad business in this location seemed a perfect match for his peddler situation. Uh, but as time passed, he found another way to make money. It began by first running out bed space in his one bedroom apartment. He later expanded that to a house and then to an apartment and eventually had a full-fledged real estate business. As more and more African-Americans came to Chicago, Binga's business took off, but so did the animosity of whites, fueled by fear and a good amount of hysteria. All this is not to say that Binga's efforts were all pure and righteous. There was definitely abundance of self-interest as with every entrepreneur, and he certainly had his faults. Sure, Binga tried to break the physical racial boundary lines of the city, but he also cashed in on them. Binga, after all, was an unapologetic capitalist. Still, there was an unmistakable fairness in what he tried to do. Binga eventually went big and leased the Bates building at around 36th in the state in the heart of the Black Belt. If we could go to the next slide. It would be the beginning of an empire that grew to dozens of houses, apartment buildings, and commercial offices. You can see the apartment building is to the right. It's six stories. And as you can see, Bingo was not shy about putting his name on the side of it, which he also had his bank right to the left there. That was his first bank building. And uh, Bingo was a great marketer and put his name on all this. But as the Black Belt grew, so did the hunger for entertainment. And Binga, Binga made his way in that world too. That began with his connection to a smoky saloon and music venue and gambling operation owned by Robert T. Motts. And if I can just look at the inside of the Pekin Theater in the next slide. The Pekin Theater represented the beginning of what would become a staple of the Black Belt, music, gambling, and dancing. As poet Langston Hughes would later say on State Street, you could get anything you wanted from a foot race to a murder. And of course, when there were murders or deaths of any kind, there were funeral homes on State Street and Binga had connections there too. During the day, the State Street Strip, which was also known as the Stroll, was a place of commerce where men like Binga grew business. But at night, it was what the Chicago Defender would call the Mecca of Pleasure. And Binga did business by day or night with deposits from saloon owners and policy kings. And you can see, kind of how, what a, a crowded situation it was in the Pekin Theater, which was always jammed late into the night. And if you, I can show you the outside of Pekin Theater, which is at 27th and State on the next slide. You can see it might not look that impressive, but State Street soon became lined with buildings like this, uh, which were, had uh, dance halls and, and gambling and music venues. And I'll go to the next one. Here's a pretty famous one. Uh, called the Cafe de Champion, which was Jack Johnson, who was the heavyweight champion. Uh, uh, you know, he became famous because he took on any white boxers, heavyweight champions, and became the world champion. And he became hated also, I think, because he was so outspoken. He dated and married white women, and 
he was uh, he didn't care. He he was a little like like Binga. He he had an attitude that you know I'm going to do what I want to do. His place was called the Black and Tan Club, which allowed and, and encouraged uh, black and white mixing for dancing and gambling and uh, drinking. He lived this, with his wife, Etta, in the apartment above. Now, Etta uh, was a, a white woman, and she found it very difficult living with the tensions between blacks and whites in her situation. She says, I'm a white woman and tired of being a social outcast. And so, certainly, ever she said that remark, she unfortunately put a revolver to her head and killed herself. Shortly after that, uh, Binga's priest gave her the last rites and the black belt, as you can see, could be a harrowing place. But it was a place of both poverty and wealth. All classes lived together in the black belt, out of necessity. There was really no other place to go and Binga changed that. As Binga's wealth grew, he was constantly being hit up for loans where he took rings, jewelry, and other items as collateral. Eventually he established a bank in 1908, but it was his real estate business that was bringing in the cash. In fact, in 1910, he leased an entire block uh, at 47th and State from a white meat packer. His lease ran for 30 years, and in 1910, think of this, at $240,000. Now this is the way Bingo would often do business. He would go in, he'd lease a place out, and eventually pay it off, usually before the lease ran out, as was his custom. He loved putting his name on everything, as I mentioned, and everything he touched. And an editor of The Defender once said, I'll, I'll, if we can go to the next uh, slide, I'll show you. This was what he called, what was called the bingo block. And like I said, he loved putting his name on everything he touched. An editor of The Defender once said, he didn't know anyone who loved the sound of his own name more than Jesse Bing. So predictably, this strip was called the bingo block, as I mentioned. Now, if we go to the next strip, next slide, uh, Binga State Street, there was a State Street Carnival that Binga initiated or helped to initiate. And you can see his picture is in the center with the, with the mustache. And uh, he organized this to, to, to a big parade down State Street. And it was basically there to show that the black belt or blacks in general could accomplish anything whites could, including uh, banks, uh, bakeries, funeral homes, tax give, all the businesses that would be along State Street. I'm gonna give you now to a 1950 view of the bank in the next slide. And this was uh, Binga's bank. Again, it's a little foggy on the picture, but again, Binga put his name on, on the top and you'll see later in the, uh, the next slide. He also marketed himself as B or the big B as the defender called him. And there's this bank again. And this is the Bates apartment building to the, to the right and with a big B on there. And that B was also the symbol he had on his passbooks, on the front of all the passbooks at his bank. But as Binga's bank success grew, so did racial animosity. Binga's world was underlined by the failure of the most American of promises. If you work hard and make money, you should be able to live wherever you can afford to live. At least that's the promise of this country. America is supposed to offer the American dream on equal terms to everyone. Binga's story exposes the hypocrisy of that promise. As a realtor, Binga was doing what realtors do, finding homes and apartments for people. But for many white Chicagoans, Binga was doing something he shouldn't, moving black customers into white neighborhoods. Even though he never used the wild tactics of paddock pally, he was labeled a, black, a blockbuster. But Binga was merely doing business, meeting supply and demand, and nonetheless, he became a target. After Binga himself moved into a white neighbor, he became a bullseye for race haters. And that became increasingly dangerous. We can go to the next slide. This is uh, Binga's house with a large wraparound porch uh, that he moved to, which is at 5922 South Park Avenue, as I mentioned earlier. I just wanna give you a little hint of something that happened there, of one event, and there were many. But shortly after midnight on June 18th, 1920, a black sedan slowly pulled up in front of Binga's house, as you see in the picture. The man got out, stepped off the running board and hustled to the front stairs and gingerly placed a package on the porch and hurried back to the car. As the sedan pulled off, the package exploded in a deafening blast that sent the porch pillars spinning in the, onto the streets while sharing windows up and down the block. If I can go to the next slide. Neighbors, all of them white and some still in pajamas, quickly gathered in front and tiptoed through the debris to look at the damage. The portico was blown off, as you can see. Half the porch floor was gone. 
and the remainder of the roof was left sagging. Remarkably, no one was hurt. And while those who gathered after were startled by the brass, they weren't, blast, they weren't surprised. This was the fifth time in seven months that Binga's house had been bombed and it would be bombed again. Each bombing was racially motivated. The Bingas were the first black family to move out of the block and were still the only black family. When they settled there in 1917, nobody bothered them. In fact, neighbors were very friendly to them, exchanging pleasant greetings whenever they came into contact with them. And even until the day of the bombing, Mr. and Mrs. Binga were on friendly terms with their white neighbors, according to the July 3rd, 1920 edition of the Broad X, one of Chicago's black newspapers. But as South Side neighborhoods increasingly turned from white to black, racial tensions grew along with threats of violence. Binga became a focal point. His business was bombed twice and there were countless other bombings aimed at properties he owned, sold, managed, or leased. From July, 1917 to March, 1921, there were 58 racially, racially motivated bombings in Chicago. And while most of the bombs left only splintered wood and shattered plaster, some were deadly. Two people were killed, including a six-year-old girl who one night was catapulted out of her grandmother's bed by a fatal blast that slammed in her into the ceiling, fracturing her skull and causing internal damage to her body. Through it all, however, no one was targeted more than Jesse Binga. You know, of course, like many people, Binga was different things to different people. Binga had his critics in the black belt. Some said he ran with the wrong crowd because he welcomed gamblers and crime bosses as customers and partners in his bank. And some said he was only about the money as he raised rents and home prices. At one time, a lawyer, alderman, and community activist named Earl Dickerson once described Binga simply as a mean son of a bitch who used all the means he could on people. He said Binga had no interest in racial ideology. He was interested only in acquiring money and power. And quite frankly, there was some truth to that. But Binga was also a race man and a pathfinder. You see, Binga became a revered symbol of success, hope, and uplift in the Black Belt and in the nation. He preached economic self-sufficiency and he lived it. He was a realtor, banker, and millionaire philanthropist. He rose early and worked late. He made good money and lived well. He had a nice house, as you can see, with an elevator, a small gym on the second floor, a music room, a modern clothes dryer the size of a walk-in closet in his basement, and he traveled in a limousine with a driver. You know, he was also charitable. He provided gifts at Christmas for hundreds of school children in the Black Belt. He donated coal to heat the schools. He financed countless college educations for many promising Black students, and he even enjoyed doing small acts of kindness, like cooking breakfast for children making their first communion. In fact, his money was spread beyond the black belt and sometimes in small private ways. Once when a white grammar school child who happened to be the sister of James T. Farrell, who would later become famous as a novelist, asked him to buy raffle tickets for church, Binga immediately bought the whole book. In fact, Farrell made Binga a character in a Studs Nonigan novel. He called him Abraham Clarkson. And he described the house bombing where excited and gaping people eyed the wreckage with approval but they knew the only way Clarkson, in other words, Binga would leave his house was in a casket. You see, the major part of Binga's public and private demeanor was that he didn't back down. He lived, he lived life unbowed and on his own terms and this quality alone was revered in the black belt. Throughout the bombings, the threats and the personal attacks, he stood his ground, even in 1919 when he became a lightning rod for the deadliest race riots in Chicago history. Riots began with the drowning of a 17-year-old black youth named Will Eugene Williams. Eugene was swimming in Lake Michigan off the so-called black, black Beach that ran from 26th to 29th Street. An invisible line in the water separated it from the white beach at 29th Street. On that hot day in July, some black men and women had entered the water from the white side and fights broke out with white beach goers. Williams and several friends were floating on a makeshift raft of railroad ties a few hundred yards from shore when a white man scampered out into the breakwater and started throwing rocks at the teens. Williams ducked, but was clipped in the forehead and eventually drowned. A white police officer refused to arrest the white man who was throwing the rocks and instead arrested a black man on shore in a different altercation. And that lit the fuse. Fights broke out and that turned into riots that lasted for days. If we can go to the next slide. 
During the riots, uh, black homes were targeted, particularly black homes in white neighborhoods. And you can see this family is moving out under police guard. You can see the windows have been broken and obviously they have been threatened and harassed until they moved out. Uh, if we can go to the next, the next two slides are kind of important because I wanna read you a little anecdote from the book that will show you what was going on. See, this is a cheering crowd of kids and women uh, for the burning of a house that was owned by a black. And you can see the windows broken and it's a, it's a jubilation. And, and the next, if you can do the next one too, the next slide. This is what typically was happening during the riots. Uh, a black person, black man, for example, coming home from work would be targeted and chased uh, and, and often beaten. I'm gonna tell you this little story. It was quitting time, 5.30 p.m., July 28, 1919. John Mills was headed home from the stockyards on the eastbound 40, 47th Street trolley car. After traveling only a few blocks, a mob of about 50 white teenage boys appeared and surrounded the streetcar, forcing it to stop. The boys started rocking the car, and Mills could hear someone clomping around on the roof above with the sound of thunder. A white teen on the roof yanked the trolley loose from its wires while a couple others jumped on board slamming bats into the wall, throwing bricks at blacks, hiding beneath the seats, and clubbing those who tried to make a run for it. Mills was one of the few to get away. When he stepped onto 47th Street, he was met, met by hundreds of howling whites now lined up along the street. A picture of that is kind of similar to what we saw of that, of that house that had been burned. White children had made their way to the front of the crowd, squirming in to get a better view. There were tiny boys and girls, some as young as four, and five years old with faces so twisted by their angry taunts and yells that they looked much older. Mills took off. He ran to Normal Avenue where the full weight of a hurled brick caught him in the back, knocking the wind out of him. He stumbled and slowed, struggling to get his breath and soon was tackled from behind and the, and the beating began. He fought to get up a couple of times, but the mob was like a heavy blanket on top of him. Their bodies suffocated Mills. As he tried to stand up one more time, a man clubbed him with a two by four cracking his skull. Those eyes blinked and closed as he lost consciousness. The beating continued until his Mills body lay limp and twisted in the street. Mills was dead. Now that was typical of what was going on during the riots. The riots lasted roughly about a week was when the worst part and National Guard called in, you know, and it, it was, it became a, a horrific, uh, isolation of the black belt because no supplies were coming in. But if you can, if I can go to the next uh, slide, this is a scene in front of Binga's bank and you can barely see Binga's name right in the middle. And uh, everybody is here for basically two reasons. One, Binga's bank became a, a pay station for people who couldn't get their checks from work and people needed the money and they needed supplies and Binga almost acted like a quartermaster in that regard. But also Binga's bank became a clearinghouse for information too. So you would go up there to find out what was going on. And a lot of rumors were, were out there. But uh, during this time, and uh, this didn't appear in the book, but uh, somebody, a reader of the book sent me this and I was fortunate to, to include this in this talk today. But uh, Binga was interviewed uh, by the War Department during the middle of the riots and Binga, according to that interview, was described in the interview as being largely responsible for selling property to Negroes in the high grade residence districts. And there, he also emphasized that there would continue to be trouble, Binga did, so long as there was any attempt to separate blacks and whites. This War Department memo dated August 2nd, 1919, said Binga felt the police had very much abused the colored people and had not interfered with the whites. He also noted that Binga seemed to harp on the fact that the colored race was fully as equal and wanted to give the impression that if anything, they were somewhat superior to the white race. That's so Binga. Uh, Binga was an outspoken guy and he was always one to defend himself and I would say to defend the black belt. When the riots were over, 38 people were killed, hundreds injured and a thousand people were left homeless. Much of the damage was in the black belt. Imagine just walking outside the confines of the black belt would put you at risk. Even before and after the riots, that was the case. Anyone from the Black Belt had to be wary of where they were and who was around them while just walking into other neighborhoods, white neighborhoods. When poet Langston Hughes first came to Chicago, he crossed 
Wentworth Avenue in Breezeport just to look around and soon found himself attacked. A few days after the riots, an ominous letter came from Bingham, blaming him for the riots and threatening him with the words, you know what comes next. It was signed by a group called the White Hands. Bingham didn't let any of that stop him. And within years, he soon established the first black owned state sanctioned bank, different than just the bank. In 1908, he established a private bank, which was largely unregulated. But he also wanted to, to show everyone that he could have a, a regulated bank that would be just as good as any other white bank. And if we could go to the next slide, this is uh, in early January of, I think it's 1921, and Binga is standing there in the middle, and that was the day he became a state sanctioned bank. And by this time, the Black Belt Strip, called the Stroll on State Street, was entering the golden age of capitalism and bingo was at the center of it. But it was also a, a time for uh, the creation of jazz up and down State Street on the, the so-called stroll. If I can go to the next uh, slide. This is a, a place near bingo and you can see how, how big it is and open. This was a, one of the hot spots in the Black Belt, the Sunset Cafe, but there were many of them, 30, 40 places that has had jazz and as you call it, syncopated music, as it says down at the bottom. But it was also a time for legendary performers. And I'll, if I can go to the next uh, slide, it, it, legendary performers like Jelly Roll Martin, Louis Armstrong, and Freddie Keppard and the Creole Band. There was so much jazz on State Street. One jazz man in the era said, if you held up a trumpet in the air at midnight on State Street, it would start playing itself. And you can see this is the Dreamland Cafe, an advertisement for it which was operated, owned and operated by Binga's brother-in-law, Elijah Johnson. And you can see down here, uh, here was an advertisement for Louis Armstrong play. You know, and the Bingas were of course, you know, looked up to and they were the, the center of the social life. Even though they didn't go out much, they had one main party every year, but it was the party. And if you go to the next slide, this was the, uh, invitation that Binga had for one of the many parties he had. And you, as you can see, it was, uh, uh, you know, done upright and formal. It says dancing and in typical Binga fashion, it was done at 10 o'clock sharp, he said. Binga was a stickler for details. And this, as a matter of fact, this invitation had been sent to W.E.B. Du Bois in 1927. Now, and I'll go to the next slide. In 1924, Binga unveiled a new bank building, which was a $120,000 bank building. And in the first week, the Defender estimated that 100,000 people came in just to see it. It was a source of pride and a symbol for the Black Belt. And if you can go to the next slide, please. And this, Binga built this, the Binga Arcade. Now this is shown in later years, but it was a six story building with a, uh, you can see on the top two floors was really a fifth floor, but it was two stories high, was a ballroom. And the next slide will show you the inside of the ballroom. But, uh, and that was built, the arcade building was built for $400,000. Can you imagine, in 1929? Certainly bankers and landlords, and Bingo was both, are sometimes feared or even loathed by their customers. But while he wasn't beloved, he was supremely respected, largely because of his courage. But most of all, he represented a possibility to the everyday person in the Black Belt. If Binga could rise to great financial heights, why couldn't they? He opened the door to hope. When I began researching Binga, time and disinterest had already begun to erode his story. I first heard of Binga in 1987 while working as a reporter at the Sun Times. I was, of course, <clears throat> intrigued by the fact that he was the first, on the first Black Bank, but I also saw there was much more to his story. The more I learned, the more fascinated I became because he was just supremely confident, smart, and above, most of all, an extreme individualist. As I pulled straight on the story, I became captivated, but time was challenging the telling of the story. Since Binga died in 1950, there were few people left who could give firsthand accounts of or about Binga. His only child, in fact, died a year before I began my research. Fortunately, I was able to interview a handful of people who knew him, two grandchildren, 
a relative who once lived in Binga's house for several years, and a man who once worked in a Binga building and heard a Binga speech at an Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity meeting. Alpha Phi Alpha, the well-known uh, black fraternity, Binga was an honorary member. He did not go to college, but he was made an honorary member. I was also lucky enough to meet a delightful man named Ripley Binga Mead Jr. Ripley himself was also a successful Southside realtor and a relative of Jesse. He knew Bingo well, and in fact, Ripley's parents both worked at Bingo's bank for nearly two decades. And I had several very long conversations with, uh, with Ripley, and it was just a, a wonderful time to get an insight into, into Bingo, the family, and the times. I'm a bit embarrassed to say, however, I began researching in ancient times, you know, BI before the internet. I started old school at a library. As a city, we were fortunate to have the Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection at the Woodson Regional Library at 95th and Halston. It contains a treasure trove of African-American history in Chicago. And I began there with microfilm and clippings of black newspapers like the Defender, the Broad Axe, the Whip, and the Conservator. Later, the internet would open those doors much wider to an assortment of archives and newspaper collections across the country, and also to library connections which were, you know, some of the special collection librarians were a fantastic help to me in Massachusetts, in, in Georgia, in Chicago, Ohio, and Wisconsin. But apart from interviews with a few people still alive who knew Big, and all of them now are, are, have passed, I used genealogical records and newspaper files to find any tiny obscure clues or hints about who Jesse Bingo was, and that led to more trails of information. For example, the beginning of my research, in the beginning, I found it difficult to flesh out details about Binga's childhood. It became a treasure hunt. Slowly pieces came together, first through newspapers then through census records and court files and other books and documents. Through a search of newspapers, I once came across an intriguing detail in an obscure part of an 1878 Detroit Free Press story. It was just one paragraph, but it was instructive. Jesse Bingo was mentioned being in a quarrel with someone named Barney Schaefer over a velocipede, you know, that type of big wheeled early bicycle that had the pedals on the front axle that looked impossible to ride or even just get on. The fight happened in front of the Free Press building on a Saturday morning in Detroit. During the quarrel between these two boys, as the account described them, Schaefer reportedly stabbed Bingo in the arm and fled. Jesse was just 13 at the time, and this anecdote provided a small clue into Jesse Bingus' character. It suggested that Jesse wasn't the kind of guy who got pushed around or run from, ran from a fight. Later information seemed to confirm that, as I've mentioned. Slowly, through years of research, decades in fact, Bingus' story emerged. One big reason Bingus' life seemed forgotten was how it ends. Late in life, and the Great Depression came, and Bingus' career ended in a swift and tragic tailspin largely of his own making. Binga, as you know, ended up in prison. But that's a whole nother story that I'll save for explanation in the book. If I can go to the next uh, slide. Binga's downfall, again, I apologize for the slide condition, but uh, it was one of the few I could find. Binga's downfall began with the Great Depression. Less than a year after the stock market crash, Binga's bank was the first bank to close in Chicago, but it didn't have to. Binga's Bank was a member of the Chicago Clearinghouse Association, a fact he proudly broadcast in gold letters on the bank's front window. It was meant as a source of comfort for depositors, a kind of safety net. A white banker who was once president of the Chicago and uh, Cook County Bank, bank Owners Association questioned why the clearinghouse didn't support Binga's Bank when it had troubles, as it should have. It even, they even lied about Binga being a member. By not helping, Bingus Bank became the first domino in the line of banks that fell during the depression, during the panic in, in Chicago. If it had been saved, it might have saved others. Ultimately, however, Binga became penniless working as a parish janitor on the south side of Chicago. I'll show you just one more, next slide. This is Binga in his old age, lined up at, for mass at St. Anselm's where he uh, was the janitor, and, but also helped in you know, the business of the, of the parish. Uh, Bingo was Catholic, which helped him in, with a lot of connections, mostly political. 
but only 4% of Catholics in Chicago at that time were Catholic. I mean, only 4% of Blacks at that time in Chicago were Catholics. I'll go to the next slide. Binga died in 1950 and was, is buried here and in Oakwood Cemetery, which uh, several mayors are buried there. Uh, Enrico Fermi, the physicist is buried there. Harold Washington, Big Bill Thompson, uh, Jesse Owens, and Jesse Binga. Binga's story is not just a quintessential Chicago story, it's a quintessential American story. It's about how for an African-American money, success, and politics is constantly tangled in race and discrimination in a country that has historically denied equal access to even hope and aspiration. Now, the Black Belt has now long faded, at least the, the stroll, the State Street portion of the Black Belt has long faded. We go to the next slide. This is like one of the last pictures of Binga's Bank and the arcade taken in the early 1960s. You can see right before they were torn down, you can see behind them is Stateway Gardens, which was built in the 50s but they too have been torn down and uh, demolished in, from, from around 2001 to 2007. And here's what's on uh, the site of Binga's uh, bank now. The next slide, please. You can see this from the Dan Ryan. It's the 35th in state. It's a 20 story tower, I, IIT tower, because the IIT campus now is up and down most of what used to be the stroll. If you read my book on Binga, I hope you like it, and I hope you might find Binga's life as interesting as I did. That was so interesting and heartbreaking, um, and so well presented, those pictures. You know, it, I felt like I was um, watching a uh, mystery, and I kept thinking, please let those buildings still be here. Please let those buildings <laughs> still be here. Please let, and then... Uh, yeah. I, was, I did not like the way that mystery ended. No, and as a matter of fact, Binga watched some of those buildings get uh, auctioned off at the very end of his life, including the house where he got married to his wife. I mean, how heartbreaking. I'm going to ask a quick question. Did Was he a journalist? As Not a journalist, as in a reporter. Did he keep a diary or any sort of memoirs or anything? No, and not that I know of. And uh, Ripley Binga Mead Jr., who was that great source for me, had a box of memorabilia that belonged to him okay. that he kept in an apartment building on the south side that were stolen. And inside was, uh, according to Ripley, uh, was, you know, like a, a jersey with Binga Bank on it for a little, for, you know, a, a kid playing baseball and bank documents, which probably Whoever stole it probably opened it up and go, what do I need this for? And but it would have been a great treasure trove to at least have it the harsh uh, collection or, you know, and a lot of people, Binga had a little booklet that he put out called The Certain Sayings of Jesse Binga. And like I said, he was not shy of putting his name onto things or touting his own abilities. Sure. And I couldn't find a copy of that anywhere. And if anybody does find one, it'd be great to donate it to the library at 95th and Halston. So does he, I mean, it sounds like what you've done is great research in bringing all of his accomplishments to light, but is there, does, has any other museum or any other history thing done a d display on him or a, any sort of? You know, there's a, a, a little museum in Canada which is a family museum, but doesn't necessarily stress Jesse Binga, but it mentions the Bingas. <clears throat> and uh, that's the only one that, that I know of. I mean, he's a, he's a little bit of a presence in the archive material at the Detroit Library too. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna go to the, we've got a lot of people asking questions. Let's start with John and Kathy, Westberg. The monument in the cemetery at Oak Woods said Binga slash Ray. Who was Ray? Ray was his uh, wife's sister's married name. And you know, one of the ironies of that uh, tombstone is the only name that doesn't appear on it is Jesse Binga's. 
And, you know, he was buried after uh, his wife and Mushmouth Johnson is buried there. The flip side of that uh, monument has Johnson on it. And uh, it was a Johnson who married into the Ray family. And that was his, uh, Jesse's sister. Thank you. Uh, Holly, you have a question. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi. Sure. Uh, I was just wondering if there was any, ever any restitution uh, to the Binga family for what happened with their bank and property. Uh, no, as, as a matter of fact, Binga did all he could, uh, at least according to him, and I think there's some evidence to support that, to give back as much as he could when the run on the bank made it collapse. And he, but he, he had a lot of property that was at that point, point very devalued by the uh, situation in, in America, you know, the depression, and they couldn't really keep up. A trustee in bankruptcy was, was appointed and they couldn't really keep up with the payments, not even for heat. So uh, uh, no, there was no money to be had to, to be given back, and particularly to depositors who were the most affected by the collapse of the Binga Bank. It's just a terrible time. Um, Trudy Doyle. Okay. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi. I was um, wondering where's the current Bronzeville neighborhood in relation to the area that um, Binga's Bank was and and you know the social life. Right. Uh, the Bronzeville area is a, is a little east of there. And I mean, the, the stroll was the main strip, the capitalist strip of, of uh, and, and the entertainment strip of what was called the Black Belt. But the name Bronzeville didn't really just get used until about 1930 uh, for a reporter uh, who later ended up as a defender and the defender started popularizing that name. Uh, Black, Black Belt was really the name that was called to all through Binga's you know, active career time. Thank you. But Martin Luther King Drive is part of where the, the old, uh, where Brownsville is. Okay. Uh, Meg Herman, you have a question. Um, so uh, did the, did Jesse Binga and the uh, Johnson publishers mingle? Were they in the same era? And did they, did they uh, cross each other's paths? Uh, not to my knowledge. And, and, you know, Binga kind of faded from uh, pop, you know, his, his big image faded when he went to prison. And Johnson's, the, the Johnson's that, that Binga married had no relationship that I know of to the uh, Johnson's of Ebony Magazine and publishing. Well, it is possibly the most common last name other yeah. than Smith, so it's probably, yeah. yeah. Um, Ms. Adler, I'm going to go ahead and ask for her. How did you get interested in this topic? You know, it was the 150th anniversary of the incorporation of the city of Chicago, and I was assigned to do a story on the oldest black families and the oldest white families I could find. Okay. And the Mead family, uh, it, like I mentioned, Ripley Binga Mead Jr., his, I think it was his grandfather, great grandfather, came here in 1849 and became a pretty successful guy in his own right. And uh, so it was through there that I, I realized that one of those family members had married into the Binga family. And then I learned of Jesse Binga. And I thought, hey, I've never heard of this guy before. It'd be a pretty interesting story. And, I and bet in your line of work, that has happened to you quite a few times where you've started yeah, you know, there, and then it just- Right, there was a, a reporter who used to do a comp, Seymour Hirsch, not Seymour Hersh, uh, can't remember his name slips me right now, but he always would write things I found on the way to looking something else up. You know, it's, it's kind of like the internet today. You start looking for something, all of a sudden you go down a rabbit hole. Oh, yeah, but yours is actually productive. I think the rabbit <laughs> holes we go on with the internet, it's like, did I just waste 15 minutes learning the history of borscht? Like, did yeah, I need right. to know <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got Carol Conboy has a question. Okay, I just had a question about how did Mushmouth get his name? I have some ideas, but I'd like to hear if you know. Well, there are, it's, it's unclear, but there are, there are a couple theories that he would uh, mumble, but I think probably a, a 
one of the stronger theories is that he was uh, very used to using swear words oh. and, and, and had a great facility with them. So uh, that, that was, I think, one more prominent. Well, but who, but I don't know, really know question. for sure. That is a very different type of mushmouth. Wow. You know, it's interesting, these guys, you know, Mushmouth, uh, Bing, uh, Robert Abbott, who ran the Defender, they, these, and even though Bing, or Mushmouth and Bingo were both in the world of entertainment to some degree, uh, they were not drinkers uh, and, and not smokers, and uh, they were real disciplined business guys. Well, yeah, they're, they're making money. They're too busy I, making money. Um, okay, Marky has a question about um the jazz places mark if you want to ask her the jazz places around or along the stroll go ahead oh yeah you know i wondered if uh white people were allowed to cross into the black places to al along the stroll to hear the jazz were they welcome yes absolutely they were yeah and you know like i mentioned with uh jack johnson's place it was called a black and tan place which a lot of the newspapers found to be outrageous that the, the races would be mixing, but in the black belt, that was welcomed. Well, that, I mean, because they were thinking about income, probably. Right, right. Yeah, they, they didn't care. They just wanted money. Right. That seems pretty reasonable to me. Um, okay. Um, oh, boy, the questions are coming in. See, this is great. Um, Mary Lynn... You have a question about um, religion. Let's see. If yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. How Catholic was he? Did he attend church regularly? Was he active in Saint Anne's own parish? He was. Uh, he was very active in the church, and I would I call. I call him a, a very devout Catholic, and the. Uh, the sisters of the Blessed Sacrament were instrumental in trying to get him out of prison because he had helped the church many times before with heat, coal for heat and that kind of thing and, and school supplies for the kids. And like I said, he enjoyed uh, cooking breakfast for first communions when that was being made. And he was at uh, St. Monica's, which was the earliest black church in Chicago and then St. Elizabeth's. Okay. And then later at St. Anselm's. And uh, he was uh, donated money, time. He was very close with the pastor at St. Elizabeth's, uh, was, which uh, was a German priest who had, you know, a, a, what I was thick German accents, but was uh, considered the great black evangelizer because he converted like 3,500 blacks to Catholicism wow. in Chicago. Wow, that's, that's a feat. Yeah, and Bingo um, was, of course, pushing for all that. So, I mean, I think, I think the question I think everyone's kind of trying to, to sniff around is, is he, it sounds like he had a community. Um, and when he had his fall, was it just that everybody fell at the same time? So kind of no one could help him because he had helped so many people. Was it just that there was no one who had the means to help him when he had his fall? Yeah, and there's kind of a split on that. I mean, he had 10,000 people signed a, a telegram to, to or a petition to get him released from prison. I mean, he was he was still very well respected in the black belt, but you also have to consider he was the guy who was charging high rents and high property property okay. prices, which didn't make him exactly beloved, but okay. he was such a character uh, symbol of what could be and possibility that uh, nobody wanted to see that see that die and and i think he uh even till the, the, when he died uh it, it's I, I think some of the old timers really felt that he was still the guy uh diane stevenson you you kind of referenced this but um she has a question hi diane hi yes i think you referenced you made reference to the fact that he had grandchildren and, and I wasn't clear though, does he have descendants, direct descendants uh, around today? Yes, but uh, none that, that I know of that knew him. I mean, they know, of course, knew of him, even his grandkids. 
didn't know him that well. And that's because there was a first marriage. I get into it more in, in the book. Okay. The first part of his life, it, it involves him traveling across the country and uh, growing up in Detroit. And uh, But uh, his family, I think was, a, estranged would be too strong a word because okay. I think they loved each other, but the distance was there and a second marriage interfered with that. So, and a divorce interfered with that. So for all those reasons. Well, speaking of the book, did have they seen the book, the descendants who are still alive? Have you sent them copies? Yes. I mean, I, unfortunately, the, most of the people I talked to have passed away. Okay. And, and in fact, I'd sent one book to a, a woman who was a great deal of help who had lived in Bingus House, who passed away uh, months before the, the book came. But I had talked to that woman's daughter and, okay. and sent the book and she was appreciative of that. So. Oh, that's great. Well, let's talk about where people can find the book. Um, I know it's available on Amazon and Northwestern University Press. Are those the best suggestions if someone wants to pick up a copy? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of the bookstores in Chicago should have it. And if they don't, we should demand they have it. <laughs> well, exactly. Everyone call, get picket signs. There's nothing yeah. else going on right now. Right, right. Um, well, you know, and if you do, you know, we always on uh, with the 19th Century Charitable Associations, we always look out for the little guy. So if you can find that at your local bookstore, like the book table or um, get it there. But if, if this is something that you think would make a great holiday gift, I have a feeling Amazon can get it to you before Friday. So, um, you know, if you think this is, you've got some history buffs or some Chicago fans in your family, this sounds like a great gift. Um, Don, before we wrap up, um, do you have any last parting words? Do you want to tell us what you're working on next, actually? No, you know, actually, I'm still just this. trying to sell the bingo book, but, or, or at least get the word out on it. But, uh, you know, it was, I, I got to say, as a Chicago guy, and I mean, I think Binga's book resonates beyond the Chicago borders. And it's about race in many ways. But I think for me, and I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and I didn't really know the story of the south side of Chicago like, mm -hmm. I, like I do now, or I hopefully do now. Uh, and I think the, the Binga book will tell you, a, hopefully, a, a lot about the origins and the problems that were created for the uh, black community in Chicago and how problems that we're still living with today. Well, that's what I was going to say. It, it gives you an understanding on why we're where we are today, probably. Yeah. It was the start of all that. Um, and it maybe would give people more of an insight of what we're dealing with now. Well, it was also how, you know, in, in many ways, capitalism was smothered by the discriminatory borders that were put around the black belt. I mean, if, if you're competing with people who have a market across the city and you, your market's only in, in the black belt, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. You have a limited, you have limited clientele. You've limited right, everything. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank um, you for having me. And thank you all for, for listening in. Oh, I, I think it was just so informative. I think we really learned a lot. And I think it was a curiosity sparker that I think reading the book and then we'll hopefully open people's minds to do some more learning because that's all we can, we have a lot of time right now to learn. So this is a <laughs> right. good time for it. So Don, I want to thank you so much on behalf of Deb and all of our program committee and everyone at the 19th Century Charitable Association. We just want to thank you for um, being a part of all of our programs since October. And just remember, we start back up again in January. So if you want to see what we're cooking up for January, go to our website, www.19thcentury.org. And if you want to help us make these programs great, we could use your support. You can do a donation right on the homepage of our website, www.19thcentury.org. And for everyone, it's Erin Payton once again, wishing you the happiest of holidays. Stay safe, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye-bye. Thank you again.